welcome to Logston Chapel for the 2019 George Knight Lectures. Dr. George Knight came to Hardin-Simmons University as a New Testament professor 43 years ago. It just so happens that was my last year as a student at uh, Hardin-Simmons University. And uh, he served until his retirement here in 2002 and influenced generations of students. And in his honor, in 2003, the George Knight Lectures were implemented, Lectures in Scripture, to bring the best of scholarship uh, to the campus. Dr. Knight passed away last November, a few days before the lecture, which ironically was on the theme of death and dying. And Dr. Jamie Clark Souls from Perkins helped us in our grieving for that loss and in our celebration of his life and contributions. The selection committee for the lectureship thought it appropriate this year that we do something different, that the lecture be presented by students of Dr. George Knight, and they happen to be students of George's who are on the faculty. And so the first lecture this evening is by Dr. Susan Piggott, who came to uh, the faculty of Logston in 1993 and is professor of Old Testament and Hebrew. And I'm noticing an occasional professor in creative writing these days, it, it seems, and uh, some fan club, uh, some of her fan club from liberal arts and from uh, Logston are here. Uh, tomorrow at uh, at 9.30, I'll be presenting the second iteration in uh, the University Chapel. And then Dr. Meredith Stone will be presenting the third lecture at noon uh, here in Larson Chapel to be followed by lunch. And you have the details there on your program. The theme this year is Women of the Old Testament. One of Dr. George Knight's daughters, Karen Knight Barlow, is here uh, with her husband, Jim, and I'd like to recognize them if they would please stand. Other family members were not able to be here today, but will be participating tomorrow. The family has uh, initiated an effort to endow the George Knight Lecture so that they will be established financially in perpetuity. And uh, there is an opportunity for you to participate in that. On the back of your program is a little bit of information there where you are guided to ways in which you could assist in that endowment. There is a link there online if you would like to make a contribution in that manner. Or you can contact uh, uh, HSU Advancement Office or Logston. The number is here if you would like to know about other ways to donate. Uh, there has been a challenge grant provided through the end of this calendar year. Uh, up to $10,000 of contribution will be matched by a challenge grant. So if uh, you are interested in participating in the establishment of this endowment because you remember George Knight and want to honor his memory, or because you appreciate Dr. Susan Piggott and her good work, uh, then I encourage you to participate if you would like. Would you join me as we pray together? Our gracious Lord, In this chapel, we can almost hear other voices of so many who have gone before us to speak in this place of your scripture. And we especially give thanks for the memory of Dr. George Knight this evening. And we thank you for the students whose lives he impacted, and particularly for Dr. Susan Piggott and the many gifts that she provides to her students and to those of us who are our colleagues. Give us this evening ears to hear. In Christ's name, amen. Dr. Piggott.
This lecture, Text, Tradition, and Art, Re-Envisioning Hagar's Story, is based on an article I wrote for the journal Review and Expositor in 2018 entitled Hagar, the Mother, Other, Patriarch. I've revised it substantially for tonight in order to focus solely on the events in Genesis 16. If you're interested in reading the original article, and I'm sure you are, the documentation is on the handout. Most readers of the Old Testament know the matriarchs Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, along with their counterpart patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But fewer know the other matriarch, Hagar, the Egyptian, wife of Abraham and mother of Ishmael. If they do know her, they often have negative misconceptions about Hagar and her son Ishmael. Some assume, for example, that Hagar willingly slept with Abram, essentially stealing him from Sarai. One of my students this semester told me she had been taught that Hagar was Abram's mistress, a promiscuous woman. Others condemn Hagar's supposed contempt for Sarai as evil, or they presume that Ishmael did something horrible to Isaac in Genesis 21.9 and conclude that Hagar and her son therefore deserve to be exiled in the wilderness by Abraham. Others cast a xenophobic eye on Ishmael and his descendants, associating them in a negative way with Arabs and Muslims, and tracing the modern conflict between Muslims and Jews back to the story of Hagar. This perspective has little historical value and lacks biblical support. When one reads the story of Hagar in Genesis 16 carefully and without modern preconceptions, one discovers that in Genesis neither Hagar nor Ishmael is portrayed negatively. On the contrary, the writers of Genesis focus on both mother and son as empathetic characters, something I hope to demonstrate in this lecture. Hagar is exceptional among the matriarchs, Indeed, I call her a mother patriarch because God promises her multiplied seed in Genesis 16.10, a promise given elsewhere only to patriarchs. Hagar performs roles that ordinarily only a patriarch would have performed, such as having a place named after her encounter with God in Genesis 16 or providing a wife for her son in Genesis 21. Hagar unlike the other matriarchs, should be accorded her place as the progenitor of a nation, the Ishmaelites, and should be viewed as a patriarch in her own right. In this lecture, I will focus on the text of Genesis 16 and how translation has played a role in cultivating negative traditions about Hagar and Ishmael. I'll take us through the text, comparing the NRSV translation with my own translation, highlighting how translation can be biased in subtle and not so subtle ways. A handout is provided so you can follow along. I hope to re-envision Hagar's story, reclaiming it from the biases of tradition and proclaiming that Hagar is a courageous heroine who should be celebrated. My lecture is just the first step in re-envisioning Hagar's story. Another way we can transform stubbornly negative traditions is to present them afresh through the art of poetry and drama. Thus, at the end of this lecture, two poems will be performed that bring Hagar's story to life. Hagar's story begins after God's pronouncement to Abram in Genesis 15, verses 4 and 5, that he would father a son and his descendants would be as innumerable as the stars. The scene shifts in chapter 16 to the problem that of that promise. Sarai's barrenness, first mentioned in Genesis 11:30, is reiterated in the first verse of this chapter, and Sarai, Abram's wife, had not given birth for him. Sarai's solution to the problem appears in the next phrase, and she had an Egyptian slave, and her name was Hagar. The narrator introduces Hagar by name, but neither Sarai nor Abram refer to Hagar by her name anywhere in Genesis. 
Although the actual meaning of Hagar's name is unclear, it sounds like the word Hagger, the stranger or the outsider, a fitting des description considering that she is treated like an outsider by Abram and Sarai. Abram and Sarai likely acquired Hagar when they went to Egypt in Genesis 12. Pharaoh gave Abram both male and female slaves as part of the bride price for Sarai. In Genesis 16, Sarai sees her slave as a way to remedy her barrenness. Look, she says to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from bearing. Go into my slave, please. Perhaps I will be built from her. Verse 2. The Hebrews believed God opened or closed women's wombs. And in cases of barrenness, the usual practice was for the husband to obtain a second wife, or more, in the case of Jacob, in order to produce children. It was legal for Sarai to suggest that Abram take her slave as a wife. Many interpreters argue that the slave's offspring would be adopted by the barren woman as her own child, or at least the child would become her property. This seems to be the case when Rachel and Leah's slaves bear children in Genesis 30. Other interpreters think that the purpose of surrogacy was not so that the barren woman could adopt the child as her own, but so that the slave's pregnancy would stimulate the fertility of the barren woman. This may be what Sarai meant when she said, perhaps I will be built up from her. Viewing Hagar as a means to kindle her own compromised fertility. The narrator tells us that Sarai gave Hagar to Abram as a wife, not a concubine, but as a wife, after Abram had been in the land of Canaan for 10 years, verse 3. This would make him 85 years old when he went in to Hagar and she conceived, verse 4. This act is told without any elaboration, but for Hagar, it was a forced coupling. It is important to remind ourselves that Hagar had no choice in this matter. She was a slave. She could not say no. Once Hagar knew she had conceived, however, she viewed her mistress differently. Verse 4 says, her mistress was insignificant in her eyes. The word I've translated insignificant, kalal, literally means to be light or unimportant. In other words, when Hagar looked at Sarai, she now viewed her mistress as inconsequential. Why? Hagar most likely realized that her status changed once she became pregnant with the patriarch's firstborn. She knew that if she bore a son, he would be the firstborn male. This meant that he would receive a double portion of the father's inheritance and carry on the family name. More importantly, he would be free, never a slave like his mother. Hagar also knew that she possessed the fertility denied to Sarai, allowing her to give Abram what he most desired, an heir. The NRSV renders Hagar's change of view rather harshly. She looked with contempt on her mistress. This translation implies a strong emotion, contempt, and it also emphasizes agency, she looked. My translation retains the Hebrew's more reserved idea that Sarai had simply become unimportant in Hagar's eyes. Nevertheless, even if Hagar did view Sarai with contempt, it was just a look. What Sarai does in response is far, far worse. Sarai was incensed by Hagar's new perspective and hurled her anger at Abram. May the violence done to me be upon you. I myself gave my slave into your embrace and she saw that she conceived, so I am insignificant in her eyes. May the Lord judge between you and me. Verse 5. <laughs> Readers are often surprised at Sarai's vehemence. After all, this was her idea. But her reaction gives us insight into her character. As soon as Sarai realized her power was threatened, she turned against both Hagar and Abram. And Abram? 
He meekly acquiesced before Sarai's rage, expressing absolutely no concern for Hagar or for his baby. Look, he says, your slave is in your hand. Do to her whatever seems good in your eyes. Verse 6. Abram relinquished his patriarchal obligations by taking no responsibility for either of his wives or for his unborn child. In response to Abram's flippant dismissal, Sarai acted in verse 6. So Sarai abused Hagar, and she fled from her presence. Most English translations soften the wording here. For example, the NRSV renders it dealt harshly. Also, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, the King James Version. The NIV and Holman Christian Standard Bible say mistreated. But the Hebrew word ana is a cruel verb, especially when it is in the intensive stem as it is here. It means afflict, humble, abuse. And when men are the subjects and women the objects, it can mean rape. It is the same word that is used of the Egyptian masters abusing the Hebrew slaves in Exodus 1. Sarai did not just mistreat Hagar. She humbled she afflicted her, most likely physically abusing her. Ironically, Sarai had claimed that she was the victim of violence, but the real violence was done to Hagar. So Hagar fled. One commentator notes that the word fled, barach, is often used of people fleeing from those who are trying to kill them. Hagar probably feared for her own life and at the least for the life of her baby. And the messenger of the Lord found her at the spring of the waters in the wilderness, at the spring on the way to Shur, verse 7. In a surprising turn of events, Hagar, an Egyptian slave, is the first person in the Bible to encounter the messenger of the Lord. The messenger or angel of the Lord and the Lord are interchangeable in the Hebrew Bible. The messenger is a physical manifestation of God, visible to human beings or audible, who often do not realize initially that they are speaking with God. Hagar, fleeing from the abuse of Abram and Sarai, is found by the God of her oppressors. Can you imagine how she expected to be treated by such a God. In the first exchange between the messenger of the Lord and Hagar, the messenger addresses Hagar as Sarai's slave, an ominous salutation for an escaped slave. He asked her where she came from and where she was going. Hagar responded only to the first question, from the presence of my mistress Sarai, I am fleeing. Perhaps she did not know exactly where she was going, but the messenger told her where she should go. Go back to your mistress and be abused beneath her hand. Verse 9. This command is shocking and harsh, especially since the same God later granted freedom from the Egyptians to the Hebrew slaves in Exodus. As Phyllis Tribble says, quote, Without doubt, these two imperatives, return and submit to suffering, bring a divine word of terror to an abused yet courageous woman, end quote. Nevertheless, we must hear the command to return and submit in the context of the three promises the Lord also gives to Hagar. First, the messenger of the Lord says, I will greatly multiply your seed so that it cannot be counted because it is so many. Verse 10. The wording here exactly parallels promises of multiplied seed given to the patriarchs Abraham and Isaac. Hagar is the only matriarch to receive the patriarchal promise of multiplied seed, an unusual promise considering that women don't literally have seed. And she is the only matriarch spoken to by the messenger of the Lord. 
What is even more striking about this promise is that not only was it given to a female, it was given to a non-Hebrew female. Hagar, the Egyptian slave, would be the progenitor of a nation just like her master, Abram. Second, the messenger of the Lord told Hagar, Look, you yourself have conceived and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Yishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. Verse 11. Hagar learned that her baby was a boy, and she was given a prenatal name. Yishmael, because the Lord had heard about her affliction, her suffering, she was to name the boy accordingly. Yishmael means El, God, hears, Yishma. The God of her oppressors had noticed Hagar, had seen her suffering, and chose to act on her behalf. Third, the messenger of the Lord informed Hagar what kind of man her boy would become, verse 12. English readers tend to interpret this verse negatively because most English translations make it sound like a curse rather than a promise. For example, the NRSV says, He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. The problem with this translation is that the phrase wild ass obviously has negative connotations, but the Hebrew word does not. And the prepositions translated against and at odds with do not have to be rendered negatively in this context. The first phrase, he shall be a wild ass of a man, certainly sounds like an overt insult aimed at Ishmael, poor, poor kid. But we need to hear these words within their cultural context. Hagar's son will be a pare, which is usually translated wild ass or donkey. This is misleading because when we hear the word ass, we equate it with the domesticated donkey and derive connotations like obstinacy and stupidity from the word. But the Hebrew word does not refer to the domesticated donkey. It refers to the onager, which is a wild animal that has not been domesticated. The Hebrew word focuses on the wildness of the animal. Thus, when Hagar was told that her son would be an onager, she heard a wondrous promise. Her son would be free, indomitable, and strong. Perhaps a better way to communicate this in English is to translate pere as wild stallion. Although wild stallion is not an exact rendering, obviously, it conveys the idea that Ishmael would be unconquerable and free without the negative connotations wild ass conveys. The second phrase, his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, in the new RSV, also sounds negative. However, it all depends on how one translates the preposition in this context. Prepositions, as our language students here know, have a wide range of meaning, and translators determine meaning depending on the context. Usually, this preposition, the bet preposition, means in, by, on, or with, although it can also mean against in some circumstances. However, just because the preposition can mean against does not mean we must translate it that way here. Since the context is clearly positive, this is an enunciation promise, after all. We can plausibly argue for a translation such as, his hand will be with everyone, and everyone's hand will be with him. This would imply that Ishmael would cooperate with his brothers rather than be in opposition to them. Or we could say his hand will be upon everyone and everyone's hand upon him, which might indicate that Ishmael would be an equal power alongside everyone else. Regardless of how one translates this preposition, one thing is clear, unlike his mother, Ishmael will never be abused beneath another person's hand. 
The third phrase rendered, and he shall live at odds with his kin in the NRSV, also revolves around a preposition. You never knew prepositions were so important. The preposition al. While the all preposition often means against, in this context, translating all negatively makes no sense because of the verb shakane, dwell. This verb means to dwell in peace and security. It contains no hint of animosity. So alternative ways of translating the phrase make much more sense in this context, either in the presence of his brothers he will dwell securely, or even to the east of his brothers he will dwell securely. Whereas Hagar fled from before Sarai's presence, verse 6, Ishmael will dwell securely in the presence of his brothers. In other words, he will never flee from anyone. Thus, if we translate this verse without imposing traditional negativity upon it, we hear God's promises to Hagar about Ishmael. And he himself will be a wild stallion man, his hand with or upon everyone, and the hand of everyone with or upon him. And in the presence or to the east of all his brothers, he will dwell securely that Hagar took this third statement as a promise and not as a curse is evident in how she responds. And she called the name of the Lord, the one speaking to her, you are El Roi. This unique name she bestowed upon God means the God who sees me. Hagar realized that, perhaps, for the first time since she was enslaved, someone actually saw her as a human being, a person worthy to be noticed. Neither Sarai nor Abram viewed Hagar as human. She was merely a womb for their use. But the God Hagar met in the wilderness actually called her by name, saw her, knew of her affliction, and sought to work something extraordinary out of it. In response, Hagar did something extraordinary too. She named God. She is the only person in the Bible to give God a name. Now exactly what Hagar said after naming God is unclear in the Hebrew. A literal rendering, have I also thus far seen after one seeing me, <laughs> makes little sense. The garbled Hebrew could be due to problems in copying the text over time, or it may reflect Hagar's agitation after encountering God. The Hebrew can be smoothed out to mean, have I seen God and lived? which would parallel what other biblical characters say after meeting God. But such emendation destroys the emphasis on seeing and being seen that is in the Hebrew. Perhaps the way I've translated it, have I gone on seeing after being seen by God, is a good compromise. The narrator states that the place where Hagar met God was named Bir Lahai Royi, which means the well of the living one who sees me, verse 14. Although the text does not explicitly state that Hagar named the place, it was named after her experience there. Only the patriarchs and Hagar have places named after or by them. The exact location of Bir Lahai Roi between Kadesh and Bared is unknown, though it is in the southern regions of Canaan. Just as the Hebrews, fleeing from their Egyptian slavery, later traveled to the wilderness of Shur, where God provided water for them in Exodus 15, Hagar, fleeing from slavery to Hebrew masters, found a well of water in Shur that was named after her encounter with God. Hagar obeyed the Lord's command to return to Sarai and Abram. She turned back just as the messenger of the Lord commanded, and she submitted to whatever abuse Sarai dealt out to her in order that her son might be free. When Abram was 86 years old, Hagar bore his firstborn son, Yishmael, verses 15 and 16. Traditions about biblical texts often become so deeply ingrained that we never question them. 
When English translations undergird those traditions, we may not even realize we should question them. Certainly, some traditions are innocuous enough that we needn't challenge them. For example, the tradition that the forbidden fruit was an apple hasn't exactly resulted in the dissolution of the apple industry. But some traditions are harmful because they perpetuate prejudice against people. Negative translations and traditions about the Hagar story have resulted in the demonization of both Hagar and Ishmael as enemies who threatened the so-called good guys, Abram, Sarai, and Isaac. This simply is not how the text portrays Hagar and Ishmael. More significantly, those who connect the Ishmaelites with Arabs sometimes twist the Hagar story, and especially Ishmael's characterization as a wild ass, to justify prejudice against Muslims even today. I hope I have demonstrated in this lecture how translation can help us rediscover a text and reclaim its positive message. Hagar, an Egyptian slave, was used and abused by her masters, Sarai and Abram. Yet the God of her oppressors sought her out gave her multiple patriarchal blessings, and told her that her son would be unconquerable and free. There was only one catch. Hagar had to return to a life of slavery and endure the abuse to ensure her child's future. This act of returning required remarkable courage and selflessness. Hagar was a matriarch transformed into a patriarch, a foreigner who saw God and was seen by God, the one person who dared to name God, and the escaped slave who turned back to slavery in order to become the mother of a nation. The God of the Hebrews re-envisioned Hagar. Perhaps now we too can see Hagar as she was meant to be seen. Thank you. Last spring, I wrote several Hagar poems based on the research I did for the same article. These are experimental poems in that they incorporate several different personas speaking with one another. Usually, poems are read by the poet who wrote them. But these poems lend themselves to dramatic performance. Tonight, actors from the HSU Theater Department will re-envision Hagar through the performance of two poems, Pas de Toi and Pas de Deux. Slap, none comes. 
I dare to look up, see greed in her eyes. My slave is a child. Beguiled by the dawn, by the news of a child, a son. I have done what she cannot. His seed has taken root. I eyed her my rebuke. Who is matriarch now? How she looks at me. A sneer? Defiance? I will not suffer her. Abram will pay for this crime he's done to me. These women! Like kids like pecking for place. And I want to play? Survivor slaves in your hands. Look at her the good in your eyes. What does your slave mean to me? She comes to me at night. Her blows harsh and quick. She pelts my womb with fists. My baby kicks, resists, gives me courage to flee. So I run. I rage. Free, I flee to the wilderness, circling, whirling, beaten to the rocks. I find myself lost. Haggai, slave of Sarai. A voice, captured so soon, I turn. Haggai, where have you come from? Spinning, where are you going? Spinning to the sound, I see no one. Compelled to my knee, I say, away from my mistress Sarai, I am fleeing. Turn back. Turn around. Turn back. Return to your mistress. To she who abused me? Bow to her. To her? I am only a womb. She turned her back. Turn back. I will so greatly multiply your seed. You will be a myriad, a core. Turn back. You will bear a son and name him Ishmael. God has heard your afflictions. Turn. Return. Your son will be a wild stallion leaping. His hand on everyone, no one's hand on him. He will dwell securely to the east of his brothers. But you? You call me patriarch, a woman with multiplied seed, but turn back. I carry a son, Yishmael. God hears, yet I cannot spring free. He will not be a slave, Yishmael. Untamable. Under no one's hand, he will rest safe in the land if I turn. God of my oppressors, I name you El Royi, the God who sees me. I survive, return a slave. Turn back, Hagar. I turn. And again, a big thank you to Dylan Scott, Kirsten Roach, Ariana Reed, Jake Hamilton, and to their director, Victoria Spangler. Let's have another big hand for our theater people. Also, I think we can show the same appreciation tonight for our evening's lecturer, my former student, Dr. Susan Pighead. And as we have feasted and dined on the Word of God tonight, things to think about, things to rejoice in, things to cogitate, after we're done tonight, across the foyer, there's physical food for you. Cookies, fruit, cheese, coffee, punch, 
we certainly invite you to go over there and avail yourself of that, what we have across the foyer. Spend time talking to others, talking to the people who've meant so much to us, our special guests who are with us tonight from all areas of the community and of the state. We are so thankful for you to be with us tonight. Again, in the morning at 9.30 in the University Chapel experience, and then tomorrow at noon right here again. I would ask that you please rise for our closing benediction. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your name that you have revealed to us, your names that we call you. Even someone like Hagar gave you a name. You mean so much to us, Father. Your word strengthens us, guides us, enables us to serve you with the gifts that you've provided. So we thank you. We thank you that you always bring freshness to your word. And may we honor you by living it. Give us a heart. Give us a calling. Give us a hope. And we will give you obedience. In the name of Jesus, amen. Blessings on you right across the hall. Good stuff.